Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Iowa Aging Summit. Um, today, we are talking with Joe Sulentic, who is an associate professor of practice in the University of Iowa Tippie College of Business. He is a University of Iowa Collegiate Teaching Award winner and the author of Visualize, Strategize, Execute, A Formula to Accomplish Your Dreams. Many of his students tell him it's the most effective textbook they have read in the entirety of their college experience. Joe's background was that of an entrepreneur and a race car driver before embarking on his academic teaching career. He has worked extensively in the world of Formula One motor racing and was a principal in a management consulting company with a cadre of MBA wielding US Navy SEALs. A lifelong learner, the demands of living in the country for the last 20 years has required him to become mechanically adept and horticulturally proficient. When faced with a new learning challenge, he lives by the words of his 10-year-old daughter, watch a YouTube video, dad. <laughs> <laughs> words to live by. Um, Joe, thank you for coming today and welcome. Uh, let's just start by having you tell, tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and how you kind of got from race car driver to professor at the University of Iowa. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, my background was I was an entrepreneur almost by necessity. I knew I wanted to go to Europe and race cars, and that was going to take some resources because European racing was a little different than American racing, where here you've got a very good um, step ladder of you race in an oval on a dirt track somewhere and then do another one and another one and you kind of grow into the NASCAR um, side of things where with formula car racing you really for most people would have to pay for a large part of it at least at the outset so when I was in college I knew I needed to make money and um, taking what I was learning in my classes, it became obvious with the dollar Deutschmark relationship that um, Porsches all of a sudden were half price if you could buy them in Germany. So I and a lot of other people figured out you could go to Europe, buy a car, bring it back to the US and sell it for a profit. So that's where it started with me. And I was always interested in automobiles and then moved to Europe to go racing in Italy, Formula Three. And then um, <clears throat> on the grid at one race, uh, one of the ESPN announcers walked by and I said something to him and he was kind of shocked to hear what was obviously uh, an American on the grid. And it turns out he was from Des Moines, Iowa. His name was John Bisignano and I'm from Cedar Falls, Waterloo originally. So we hit it off right away. And then he hired me to work uh, at the team he was at in Formula One. So got to go all over the world and, and see these great races and then Again, years later at the Italian Grand Prix, I found or I saw some uh, uh, Ferrari apparel and I'd never seen that in the US and I thought, geez, this should probably work in the US. So that's how it started. And then I, I started importing the Ferrari apparel and then went on to make a bunch of clothing for a bunch of number of the automotive manufacturers. Porsche, Ferrari, BMW, Jaguar, Mercedes. We were a NASCAR licensee. And then I always used my entrepreneurship to fund the racing. And uh, I found myself in Iowa City um, and thought, well, you know, if I'm in Iowa City, I might as well be going to school. So I got an MBA while I was living in Iowa City and that opened up some avenues. I famously say I didn't learn a ton from my MBA experience, but I did learn how to use Excel and I, and I built a good network. And one of my professors went on to become the Dean of the college, Gary Fetke. And years later, um, when I sold that apparel company, I found a lot of time on my hands. So I had writ I wrote, wrote him a letter and asked if he needed some res economics research done. 
And because I knew he was an econ guy, I was an econ major at UCLA. And he said, no, I don't really need any research done in economics, but with your background, maybe you ought to consider teaching in the entrepreneurship center that we just opened. So I thought, well, that sounds fascinating. So it was, and I wrote a letter um, to the individual that Gary suggested I contact. And uh, Daryl Erdman was the first center director of the John Papa John Entrepreneurial Center. And he said, yeah, we could use some help teaching a class. And then it just went from there. And then taking this entrepreneur's mindset to my teaching, I eventually came up with the um, realization that the students were not picking up in this day and age with the internet and everything else. They are not picking up a 400 page textbook and reading it and absorbing a lot. So I was determined to come up with an alternative type of textbook. And one of my students came into office hours one day and said, hey, um, have you considered writing a book? And I said, well, I have. And he was headed off to Harvard in the fall. And he said, well, I don't think I would be going to Harvard if it wasn't for your class. So we discussed it and we essentially wrote a new textbook that takes more into account how students of today learn, which is, yes, definitely reading, but not an hour and a half for a chapter. The chapters might take 15 minutes to read. There's a couple of links where they can watch some videos that support that material. And then they have to answer questions while they're even in the chapter. So they become engaged in it. And their response has been um, overwhelmingly positive. And I think it's, it's really because I analyzed how the customer consumes the product realizing that we could slightly modify it and make it more effective. So that's what we did. So I enjoy learning. Um, I enjoy pushing the limits. I mean, that's what race car drivers do. And so I like pushing the limits of having the students learn in the most contemporary manner possible. And so as long as you're talking about your book, um, yeah. one thing that I was thinking about was you know, this, this concept of um, accomplishing your dreams mm -hmm. is often, and this is a college textbook. So yes. um, oftentimes when you're talking about um, setting goals and accomplishing your dreams, it's often thought of as like a young person's game. Mm -hmm. So how can you apply those concepts to uh, a broader range of ages or like to folks who specifically are older in their, like later on in their lives, like maybe even after retirement, how do you keep that entrepreneurial spirit going? Yeah, what a great question. Um, well, it, it really has to do with what the next thing is. What's the next goal? Because yeah, we do tend to think of, oh, people in college and they have their whole life ahead of them and, and what is their goal? Well, your goal could just be to know how to grow a better garden or to what, whatever it is that you want to be. So the goals can be on a, on a shorter time frame and they don't have to be what are you going to accomplish in 20 years. It could be, what are you going to accomplish this year? And so what we really looked at in the book, taking into account a lot of different philosophies, and it's something that I really started in as an undergrad, is just trying to learn and, and better myself or become more proficient at something. So we really stole a lot from the Navy SEALs, I have to say. And the first thing is visualization. So what do you want to accomplish? And so if you're older in life, um, I never thought I really had time to work on my car. I love driving them, but I didn't have that much time to work on them that it seemed. So now I want to do some of this maintenance myself. And so I'll get on the internet and I'll learn how to change the wiper blades on my car. It seems rather simple, but when you look at it, if you can spend two or three minutes 
watching something, then you don't break the wiper arm and it doesn't cost you $80 instead of 15. So there's things that you can do. So the real question is, or, or the answer to that is, what do you want to accomplish? And it can be on a very uh, abbreviated time frame. I mean, it doesn't have to be what do you want to accomplish with your career? It's what do you want to become adept at by the end of the summer, by next year, or whenever it is. So the first thing is to visualize what you want. Um, then the strategy is, okay, how can you figure out how to become adept at that, whatever it is, learning, or as I mentioned, I wanted to become more mechanically adept because I live in the country and... You can't just drop everything, pick up, drive it to the hardware store and drive back because that's a two and a half hour scenario. And then you just have to figure it out on your own. So when I become stumped, I know there's places that I can look and I also have the confidence now that I can, I can figure it out. Because if you watch a video before you put something together, it's a heck of a lot easier to put it together. And another example, the in ground or the above ground pool that we have, you know, the first year it took us four hours to do it. The second year, after we watched the video for the second time, it took 15 minutes. So there's a lot of things you can do, but it's really just, whatever you want to figure out, to learn about. There's a lot to be said for experience um, yeah, and absolutely. sort of shortening the time of doing things that you're familiar with. Um, and you, you touched on this a little bit, but what about the brand new tasks? Like how can older folks um, keep up, keep utilizing technology? Do you have advice for how people can stay sharp and keep being creative and innovative as they age? Yes, and, and there's been all kinds of research that shows that the most creative people are not the youngest ones. They're not fresh out of college or in college, they're older. And they have taken an experience, and it might have been something that happened 20 or 30 years ago, and then they applied it to another thing. And Steve Jobs had a, a famous quote about creativity where he said that creative people feel a little guilty because they just didn't think of something amazing. They just put a couple of pieces together of what happened in their life previously and put A and B together to come up with a better answer for C. So older people can be plenty creative because they've seen more things, but I just had my mom do this the other day. Uh, she couldn't really figure out how to text something on her phone. And I'm like, come on, mom, there's 200 million people in this country that know how to send a text. You can learn. So I said, you just go to YouTube and you type in, how do I send a text? Because when you read something, it can be kind of difficult to comprehend. But if you see a video of it and you hear it and you can rewind it and watch it again, um, it's very, it's a great way to learn. And how old is your mom, Joe? She just turned 86 on September 3rd. Mm -hmm. So just this week, this past, okay, we're, we're, this is recorded uh, a, a couple of days before the seminar, but mm -hmm. um, she just turned 86. So I was real proud of her that she could do that. She's learning to text for the first time. Yes, yes. That's and wonderful. It, yeah, it, it was. And I lost my iPhone the other day. I couldn't find it. I, I was doing some tree trimming. And we just had that derecho that rolled through and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I, I was so far down on the list. I don't think anyone was gonna come out here for a month because it was just one tree with a couple of branches. So I thought, okay, it's time for a physics lesson because you have to be careful with trees um, because you can get hurt if you don't know what you're doing. So. I was thinking, all right, was I paying attention in my 11th grade physics class? And it becomes pretty obvious what's going to happen when you really just think it through. So 
keeping an open mind as you age to think, okay, I can, I can figure it out. I just let me go through it. And if you think about how the branch is going to fall or what's going to happen as you're imagining it going through, um, uh, that's what I did. I looked up a couple of videos on tree trimming to make sure that I was safe. And it's very, it's pretty easy. You're cutting away from you and you're making sure if something falls, it's falling away from you. So um, that was great. And I was, re I was real happy with the result. I think that's really important what you said about um, keeping an open mind. Uh, I'm sure that that is probably an important part of learning um, all across the lifespan. Um, and this is something that you have experience with being a parent of a kid who's 10, um, working all the time with college students who are young adults. And now as you, you are working with your mom and you yourself are getting older too. Um, yes. Like, what do you think is the most, the common thread among really sharp learners at any age? What do you think is is it that open-mindedness or is there something else that needs to be paired with it to really make it go? Boy, again, fabulous uh, discussion, question. I think it's just curiosity that you have this genuine curiousness of wanting to figure it out. Why not? Because as we look at our options, as, as we age or we're even retired, what do we just sit around and watch the television all the time? Or are we going to stay active and involved, especially with our minds? And again, a ton of research that shows if you keep your mind active, um, you stay sharper. And that, that just makes sense. Um, so I think just being curious about something and as students go the ones who are intellectually curious are always the best students i mean the ones who actually want to understand something a little better and and with all of the technology that's available to us in the western world because i i premised our, our our previous conversations with provided you have an internet connection because not everyone around the world does have an internet connection. And as I'm prepping for this and looking at the United Nations 17 goals on um, sustainability, um, and, and they talk about education, it's not a given that everybody around the world can just fire up their computer and log into, um, or log onto the internet. So provided that you have that, and I think most of, of our, our viewers will have that. Well, if then, they're here, if they're, they're here it can, and can hear your voice and see your face right now, well, they've gotten on the internet <laughs> one way or another. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they've, they've got that. So, um, so the world really is your educational oyster. Whatever you want to learn about, there's nothing holding you back. And if it's about how the dinosaurs lived when they were on the earth or, or how they were eradicated. I mean, I, my father is, is doing well as well. And we'll have conversations and he'll say, oh, I'm reading this book on what happened to the dinosaurs. And I, as a kid, I was fascinated, fascinated with dinosaurs as many were. And so, yeah, I can have a kind of, I'm curious, what did happen to the dinosaurs? Well, yeah, we think an asteroid hit, but beyond the asteroid hitting, then what did that mean? Well, ash went into the air and it filtered out the sunlight and the sunlight couldn't make photosynthesis with the plants. And so a lot of their food source disappeared. And, and there's a lot of things that went into it, but it's just if a person is curious, that's for sure. So if you're curious, then, then learn about it. Why not? Get out of your comfort zone. Instead of watching whatever episode on TV, say, you know what? I'm going to figure out whatever. And believe me, almost someone has made a video on it if you want to learn more about it and there's all kinds of classes that you can take online for free that kind of stuff too 
I think in addition to the videos, I mean, YouTube videos are famous for teaching people all kinds of things. Um, my husband is a carpenter and he actually has learned to do a lot of his tasks, at least start learning with that YouTube yeah. video. Um, right. Google's also a great educational tool. Yep. Even if you're having trouble with your technology to like Google the yes. problem, I have found that to be incredibly useful. So that's another great thing. And you know, you're talking about the world being your educational oyster. Is there a different kind of oyster at different ages? Or is it just a matter of how you open it? <laughs> Boy, that, um, I think in this day and age, in this day and age, because prior, we were all kind of led to believe, okay, you get a job somewhere, you're going to hang out there for 40 years and you're going to retire. And that at the beginning of my business career, that's, pretty much still how it was. But now it says that um, most people are going to go through five different careers over the course of their lifetime. And so you sh really should be prepared to be pliable enough or agile enough to say, you know what, if I have to learn something else, I can learn it. And you can because 30 or 40 years ago, the great repositories of information were universities or libraries. And a university certainly to a much greater degree than a library. But the repositories of information is not the exclusive domain of a university today. And so if you want to learn about something, doesn't take a whole lot. So I, I, I do not think that it's limited um, to what age that you are. Now, it might take you a little bit longer to figure something out about technology if you're older because people that grow up um, with a phone, for instance. I mean, my daughter can do things with that phone that I don't know how to do. And, and I had lost my phone the other day when I, when I got this, this equipment in to trim the tree. And I had put my phone mistakenly on the fender of the trailer that I had rented. And so when I was driving off to return the trailer, it fell off the fender onto the ground and it was approaching nightfall that later on that night. I'm like, I can't find my phone. I can't find my phone. And if I don't find it before the battery goes dead, it's really going to be a problem. So my daughter knew how to ping something on my phone. She could search for it. We saw it right by the driveway on the map. And then when we got closer, now it really was dark. She knew how to ping it, so it made noise, so we found it. So the point of that is you might need to talk to a younger person to get a little help, and that might be in the form of a literal human, or you can still search for whatever it is that you're looking for. And I said earlier that we'd stolen a bunch of stuff from the Navy SEALs in writing this book. And another thing that I stole from the Navy SEALs is, oh, steal it, I borrowed it. Don't ask a question if you can find the answer to it yourself. And so instead of me automatically sending a text to someone about like my brother, about something that I might not be able to figure out, or even the Navy SEAL, if I had a question about something that we were working on in a project, I'll, I'll stop myself and I'll try and figure it out myself before, so that I don't utilize their time just because I, it was easier for me just to say, hey, what's going on? So it's just, I'm shocked at how how much I can learn myself just by being curious about finding the answer. And with a Macintosh, especially when they came out, 
you just start exploring different things. You know, you look at the different menus, you see what, what they represent and, and you just kind of experiment and you don't necessarily have to be told what to do. You just experiment and hopefully you don't, lose the document you were working on or all the pictures on your phone but you know that's a very rare case so again it's just i love what sorry i i was just going to say i love what you said about um this sort of ask a younger mm -hmm. person notion um you know that whole intergenerational learning and and, and remaining open to the knowledge of people who are a different age than you. Yes. Um, you know, you talk about learning from your daughter and your, your mom obviously has learned yes. some from you. Um, but also we talked earlier about how those older people can actually be some of the most creative people in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, we definitely don't want to discount their expertise and knowledge and sharpness. But like, I'm interested in knowing how you would encourage people to sort of reach across those uh, age divisions. Like, what would be your like sort of big picture um, advice for people who are really interested in seeking knowledge and expertise from people who are in a different generation from them? Just ask. <clears throat> you would be shocked at how people are willing to assist if you're just genuine in your request that you want to learn. And it's funny that you talk about this intergenerational learning because in class today, I had said, I mean, the beginning of class, I said, hey, we're a big network now. There's 50 people in this class. We can all learn from each other. And so they're part of not my network and I'm part of theirs. And uh, we had a presentation where all the students last week had to present about a minute and a half of what they were interested in or what they thought was cool. And it didn't matter what it was, it's just to understand people's different interests in this group. So a couple of the students talked about um, music and that music was a big part of their lives. And, and one of the students, she had a show on KRUI, the, the local radio station of the University of Iowa. And her particular show was they looked at, on a, on a given night, different music from a certain generation. And so today, um, in class, I played some music from the 60s. I said, okay, this is what you can learn from someone of my age, the influences that we had. I mean, the Vietnam War was going on. There were, so we talked about the doors. I played some Sergio Mendez and Brazil 66 and the doors. That were, were some of the things from the 60s. And Sergio Mendez was Brazil, was uh, bossa nova music. So you can learn from other cultures. You can learn from people that are a different age. And the trick is possibly to find a young person that wants to learn from an older person because they might think that they know it all or that they don't need to learn from somebody older. But to directly address how do you deal with crossing generational lines, just sincere honesty and uh, a genuine question of, I think you'd be shocked at how many people really want to help out when it comes down to it. And especially we're, 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 um, we're spoiled living in Iowa City because it's such a intellectually vibrant town that um, that's not really gonna be a stretch to have someone in Iowa City be asked a question, oh, I wanna learn something more. So just ask. Yeah, great. I mean, I think it's really interesting how we traditionally think of learning from our elders, but that there's this increasing give and take, especially as technology is like exponentially uh, faster and faster and, and things are changing so quickly. Um, I guess when we talk about education across the lifespan, like you, like you mentioned, like, um, well, we've both been talking about the role of technology in that. Um, what do you think is 
uh, something that folks can do if they feel like they've fallen behind when it comes to technology? Like, where do you start with catching up? Again, fantastic question. Um, my suggestion there would be to start with the basics. So either your phone or your computer, one of the two. And it probably, let's say, the computer, because the phone might be harder to, to see or it's a little more cumbersome if you have to get through a couple of screens. So if we look at the computer, just absolutely figuring out the basics of how the computer works. And there are all kinds of tutorials on whatever it is that you want to figure out. You know, the, the operating system for a Windows machine versus a Macintosh. And you can just start with the absolute basics about how to open up a program, um, how to make it print, how to ask for help um, in the bar on the top. I mean, there's a spot in there that says help. You just type in, what are you trying to figure out? So I would start with the basics and, and that's the, the, the basic operations of, of how a computer works, how a search works, how you go to Google to search for a term or anything else. And, and once you try that and you find yourself doing that for 30 minutes or an hour, you're gonna get some confidence that you're figuring something out. And then when you get some confidence that you figured something else out, then your consciousness changes so that it, it, it adjusts from, oh my gosh, this is new technology, I can't figure it out, to, oh, I know how this works. I can figure out the next thing that I have to do. And mm -hmm. that really shouldn't change if you're 12 or 22 or 82, because in order to grow as a human being, we have to get out of our comfort zones. And that's what we talk about a lot about in, in entrepreneurship class, especially because as an entrepreneur, you're gonna be doing things that you didn't anticipate doing at the beginning, whether it's disciplining employees or dealing with bankers or understanding financial statements or HR issues. I mean, there's all kinds of mm -hmm. things that come into it, but um, we can't grow unless we get out of our comfort zone. And so the trick then is to get out of your comfort zone, but still maintain your calm so that you're pushing yourself a little, but not too much. You know, you don't have to say right away, oh, I'm going to teach myself Adobe Photoshop, which that is a... Uh, That's a lot of little buttons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> image manipulation, it could take a long time, but there is absolutely no reason that anyone cannot figure out the basics of how their computer operates. Well, and I think when you talk about the satisfaction of learning something new um, and how good that can feel, mm -hmm. that is something that everybody has access to at every age. Yes. Um, and, I, and I think just sort of focusing on that, the satisfaction of personal growth is uh, such a good place to jump off from. Um, yeah, now that, we're getting great. close to the end of our time, but mm -hmm. if you want to share any last few big ideas before we go to the Q&A session, I would, we would all love to hear them. So the satisfaction of lifetime learning. Um, what happens when we set ourselves a goal and then check it off, whether it's to learn the basic understanding of how our computer operates when we articulate what we want to do and we do it and we can check that off in our brains, we get a chemical hit of dopamine. Our brain creates chemicals that makes us feel good, that gives us confidence to move forward and to keep learning and expanding. And so even if it's something small, 
Articulate what it is that you want to accomplish, do it, check it off the list and see how good you feel. And that's when your consciousness can change, whether you're in elementary school or a senior. You can do it, you can figure it out, and ultimately you do it. And you feel good about yourself, and, and that's a good place to be. So with that, let's open it up to questions.